recorded so that we can. And Hillary just started recording it. Thank you, Hillary. Um, so it will be recorded. Um, and it will be posted, like I think I mentioned, on our YouTube channel later at a later date. Um, so yeah, so anyway, we um, will be covering today the Confluence Natural Area, the trails at the Confluence. We will be covering Bobbitt Hole Trail, trails at West Point on the Eno City Park, and then Holden Mill Trail. So those are kind of the four that we've done so far this month in that order. Um, and we'll talk about the history and ecology of them. Um, but as I mentioned, I do want to start off by uh, giving a little bit of background uh, about what I mean when I say year of the trail. Um, so on August 10th, 2021, the North Carolina legislature passed HB 554, designating 2023 as the North Carolina year of the trail. Um, and this was a historic designation uh, meant to showcase, promote, and celebrate North Carolina's trails in terms of their uh, positive impact on quality of life for North Carolina residents, and then also their economic impact on communities who benefit from what's known as trail tourism. Um, so the Great Trails State Coalition, or GTSC, is leading the Year of the Trail efforts in North Carolina. Uh, it's made up of over 50 organizations working to build more opportunities to get out on the trails, to hike, to bike, to walk, to run, to do whatever you like to do on trails. Um, and the GTSC uh, proudly proclaims that North Carolina is the great trails state, and they ha uh, have partnered with communities across the state to highlight trails and encourage residents to get outside and enjoy local trails and also um, explore new trails throughout the state. So uh, without further ado, let's get into talking about some of our favorite Eno trails. And I'm sorry, I don't know how to make this thing go away, but that's okay. So we're going to start um, with the Confluence Natural Area, which is located at 4214 Highland Farm Road. It is in Hillsboro. This is our little um, uh, sign signage when you pull in. Um, and it is owned by us, the Eno River Association. Um, and uh, the Confluence has two trails as of now. It has Two Forks Trail, which is about 1.75 miles, and Shepherd's Mill Trail, which is about half a mile. So there are 2.25 miles of trails total on the Confluence property with more trails planned for uh, this year or next in the in the coming, coming years. So um, the reason this property was named the Confluence is because it is where the East and the West Forks come together to form the Eno River. Um, so you can see here, you have the uh, West Fork and the East Fork that come together and form the Eno right here. So it is where the Eno starts. And then the Eno, as you may know, flows for just under 40 miles through Hillsborough and Durham before it empties into Falls Lake. Um, and the total acreage of the Confluence Natural Area is about 270 acres. There have been four different land acquisitions to get it to that size. Um, so I was 2007, so quite a while ago, um, and something that I found interesting, so the first acquisition was about 110 acres, and something that I think is interesting is a few of these land acquisitions for the confluence have been funded partially by the city of Raleigh, which you might kind of think like, why is Raleigh funding a project in Hillsboro? But as I mentioned before, the Eno does flow into Falls Lake, which is a drinking, a very important drinking reservoir for the people of Wake County. Um, and so, of course, the city of Raleigh has a vested interest in um, water upstream of, of that important drinking reservoir, which is why they um, do help to fund some of those projects protecting water upstream of, of Falls Lake. Um, so, yeah, the first acquisition was in 2007. The second was in 2008. Uh, the third was in 2017. And then finally, we had a fourth acquisition in 2022. Um, this was an additional about 69.2 acres, and it is not accessible to visitors yet. So on this map, um, you can't see quite, it, it hasn't been updated to include that, that, um, that new acquisition. So it's kind of over here is that new acquisition. If you guys, hopefully you can, can you see that Hillary or can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. 
So this this kind of area over to Eflin Cedar Grove Road um, has been the the latest acquisition, um, which is really exciting, of course. Um, so to talk a little bit about the history. Oh, and then this is the pavilion that when you pull in, if you haven't been to the confluence before, when you pull into the parking lot, um, you the first thing you'll probably see or notice is this pavilion um which uh is and there's also some pollinator gardens which is really cool right around um here and then back on the other side of the pavilion and then we do have uh these bathrooms we uh they aren't open or unlocked all the time but um but we do have those available we use them a lot during our summer camp one of our summer camps is called field station and i'll mention that again later when i'm talking about some of the species at the confluence um, but this uh, is where we do a summer camp for 12 to 15 year olds and they're out here for a week um, in the future it'll actually be two weeks but uh, they're out here for a week as of now, and we do all sorts of cool stuff and we really dig in and explore the confluence and talk about the Eno and it's just all kinds of fun. Um, so to talk a little bit about the history of the confluence, um, I do want to mention that um, the Okanichi and related indigenous groups, such as the Eno and Shikori, were known to inhabit what is now known as uh, Hillsboro for many centuries. And as you might be aware, um, there have been village and cemetery remnants found just about seven miles from the confluence, um, dating back to the late 1600s, early 1700s um, from Okanichi. Uh, but there are there are no known, you know, indigenous villages or other remnants within the confluence specifically, um, but definitely within the area. Um, but this property is known to be a uh, former farm property dating back to the 1700s. So it was actually one of the oldest farms in Orange County. Um, the farms at that time were given numbers to designate like when they were created. And this was farm number five. Um, and the land that is that's surrounding what is now referred to as Shepherd's Mill was originally granted to a man named Thomas Taylor by Governor Johnston. Um, and Thomas Taylor was a lieutenant colonel in the Revolutionary War. He was also a distant uncle to the 12th president, Zachary Taylor. Um, Taylor sold the property to William Shepherd, who was a colonel, also a colonel in the Revolutionary War. He also served as an Orange County state senator from 1793 to 1805. Um, and Shepherd, William Shepherd renamed his new plantation Long Meadows. He built a small dam on the West Fork of the river, which provided power to a small mill to support his plantation. Um, and remnants of that, of that small dam are still visible on the riverbank as is a head race, which is like, um, the part leading up to the mill, um, that's kind of dug into the ground. And that's kind of on the side of the sloping hill North of the mill. Um, and then there are a series of these um, these large rocks um, that you can still see. This is kind of when you get to this bend as you're approaching the river on Shepherd's Mill Trail, uh, you'll see this kind of bench that uh, I assume and believe that Brian Rosa, one of our amazing volunteers made. Um, and then there are some uh, rocks that have these really interesting carvings in them. They're a little bit mysterious, but thought to be dated um, from you know the 1800s. Um, <clears throat> so I did want to mention too that Shepherd William Shepherd's grandson Edmund Strudwick uh, played a big role in designing designing Dorothea Dix, which was then called the State Mental Hospital. And Edmund's son was actually an instrumental leader in the Ku Klux Klan and drew up the Articles of Impeachment against William Holden when he was governor. Um, and William Holden was the first peach in the United States to be impeached and removed from office that way. And it was basically due to his attempts at suppressing the KKK. So we will talk more about William Holden in a little bit, but I did want to mention that piece of history because it's kind of a connection between two of the trails I will talk about. And it also leads into me saying that um, William Shepard and his family, William Shepard was known to be um, a, a slaveholder and this year we will be renaming the Shepherd's Mill Trail name, um, but more to come on that. Um, so there were other property owners, including uh, Reverend Elijah Graves, Joseph Allison, several other individuals. Um, 
And yeah, and I do want to talk a little bit about some of the ecology of uh, the Confluence Natural Area. So it contains two natural heritage natural areas, which are basically ecologically significant areas designated by the Natural Heritage Program. So um, the Confluence supports several natural heritage element occurrences, including the yellow giant hyssop um, and the purple fringes orchid. You can see both of those here. Um, and several just important plant community habitats. And then the aquatic habitat supports several rare, threatened, and endangered species. Lots of that includes things like snails and mussels um, and such. These are some photos that I've actually taken just being out at the confluence. I believe most of these were on Two Forks Trail. Um, these are some native plant species that are just really beautiful. There's wild geranium, there's may apple, um, you may have seen May apple before it forms these like dense kind of colonies that are almost like these big umbrella like leaves that you can sort of see here. Uh, the dwarf crested iris, um, a Adamasco lily, so lots of um, really stunning and beautiful wildlife to, or wildflowers to keep an eye out for um, when you are out at the confluence. Now, I mentioned Field Station, which is our summer camp earlier. A cool thing about Field Station is that we do some um, really hands-on activities. We have professional um, professionals come out, professional scientists come out and teach us about the wildlife that's out there. So one of the things that I think is really cool is that we, we actually found an eastern spadefoot toad out there, um, one of our campers found one and it was the first reported occurrence in in Hillsboro which is super cool so if you're curious um the eastern spadefoot is uh found in the southeast through through the mid-atlantic states but not in like mountainous areas it spends most of its most of its life deep underground it really only comes out to breed and sometimes to eat and these little spades that they have on their feet on their hind feet they use to help them dig in these spiral like burrows <clears throat> And they really spend a lot of their life almost in like a state of hibernation. Um, so they're really just super cool. They are listed as a species of greatest conservation need in many states. Um, and then over here, we have an indigo bunting. Many of you might be familiar with them. They're absolutely stunning birds that are migratory. So um, they go to South America in the winter and, um, and then they spend their breeding season from Southern Canada to Northern Florida. So, um, this was, of course, a professional um, bird bander and uh, who showed us um, how the bird banding process works and all of that, which was super cool. But we've also seen various species of bats out there, various frogs, snakes, tur turtles, um, all you just you name it, lots of cool insects as well. Um, so and owls we hear I actually was uh, on on our confluence hike this past month, we saw a barred owl which was super cool, just hanging out in a tree cavity, watching us, and that was really special. So um, any questions about the confluence? I don't know what's going on in the chat. I don't wanna pull it up. Audrey, we had one question in the chat, which I answered, but I'm happy to mention it again. Oh. Uh, Jack asked if there are any plans to build a bridge over the West Fork of the Eno to the new property on the other side. Um, and a little in inside info for folks on this call is that, yes, we do intend to expand upon our trails at the confluence to include some of this new property. Um, those are currently in the works, and um, we're hoping towards the fall we'll be making more progress on that, and you'll get to have access to the new parts of the property. Awesome. Thank you, Hillary. Um, and great question. Okay, so we're going to move on to Bobbit Hole, um, Bobbit Hole Trail. So this trail can be accessed through the coal mill access point of Eno River State Park. Um, the address is 4390 Old Coal Mill Road. Um, Bobbit Hole Trail is 1.65 miles, but to access it, you have to start on Coal Mill Trail. So hiking both of those together, I meant to go to the next slide. Hiking both of those together um, is about 2.5 miles. Um, <clears throat> so Bobbit Hole is the deepest spot in the Eno, which is pretty cool. Uh, it was long rumored to be about 18 feet, and it was measured and confirmed in August of 2020 at 18, the deepest point to be 18 feet and 17 or 18 feet and seven inches. Um, 
Bobbitt's Hole is geologically and and hydrologically interesting because the water flows in through into the hole through a rock chute and then it leaves through a slightly concealed side exit. Um, there is a strange phenomenon that I was going to just mention noted by uh, Dave Cook, former Eno River State Park superintendent and also worked at um, you know, River Association for quite a few years, uh, for five or six years. Um, and he stated that one of the interesting things about the hole is what happens during flood stage. Checking on Bobbit Hole after flooding, the plants on the north bank are flattened, pointing upstream, which would indicate the hole becomes a whirlpool circling counterclockwise. He said, I've never seen it do this as the trails are always deeply submerged at these times, but that's what he believes to be happening, which is just pretty interesting. Um, and just to, this, this photo is, you know, walking along the trail. Obviously you can see the trail here and this is Bobbit Hole itself. So to just, in case you're curious about the namesake of Bobbit Hole, uh, it was rumored to be named for someone who drowned there actually, but no documentation has been found to substantiate that. So a new theory of uh, the name came to light from a British historian and folklorist named Simon Young. Um, he used a form of linguistic archaeology trying to figure out the origin of that name. He found that there were actually six Bobbit holes in Essex, England, um, with the earliest known reference showing up on a map from 1550. So presumably it would have been referred to as Bobbit Hole by like an English colonist at some point. Um, now, in English place names, holes are frequently associated with supernatural beings. So there are like fairy holes and mermaid holes and boggle holes and things like that. So that's like where the hole, and obviously it's like kind of a swimming hole. So that's where the whole portion comes from. Uh, but he felt, Mr. Young felt it was unlikely that the Bobbit portion was named after someone, but instead that it was related to a hob, which is an English, in, in English folklore is a type of spirit. Um, so this was just, he did some, some digging and that was like his um, best guess as to where uh, Bobbit Hole came from. And like I said, there are several Bobbit hole Holes in England as well. Now, I also want to mention, um, you know, I, I said before that to get to the Bob, to Bobbit Hole Trail, you have to start out on Coal Mill Trail. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Cole family um, and mill. So the Coles uh, were a prominent family um, in the Eno River Valley. Their origins uh, um, aren't entirely known. It's thought that they may have come from, um, from the English town of Leeds. Um, Anthony Cole, pictured here, was uh, the Eno patriarch of the Cole family, and he married Susanna Browning, also pictured here in the year 1822. Together, they had 14 children and at least 18 grandchildren. Um, and their holdings on the Eno were quite extensive. They had a mill that was located along Coal Mill Trail. Um, so that mill operated from 1813 to 1908 when it was wiped out by a flood that also affected many um, mills in the area. It'll be mentioned again later. Um, at first, it was a tilt hammer mill, which is like a um, massive powered hammer that is used to pound and polish greens. And then it was a grist mill. Um, and if you walk along the Laurel Bluffs Trail on the other side of the river, which you can see over here, um, it passes two old millstones from that, from that mill, coal mill. Um, and then the mill owner's home is still there as well as um, the mill operator's cabin, but those are on private property. Um, but interestingly, when the state began acquiring land for Eno River State Park in 1973, um, a lot of the land that now includes Coal Mill and Bobbit Hole Trails was part of that first purchase for Eno River State Park of about 500 acres. And they purchased it from the city of Durham, who, as you might know, was planning to dam the river. And that's kind of where Eno River Association was formed and um, the formation of the state park began. So, um, so anyway, that, that land was part of that original purchase for the state park. Um, okay, any questions about Bobbit Hole? We will, I'll mention the Coles again in a little bit. Um, 
but if there are no questions, I'll just keep, keep on going because West Point, man, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, information on West Point. So we'll talk about West Point for a few minutes. So West Point is located at 5101 North Roxborough Street in Durham. Um, and the trails have changed around some, but right now there are technically five trails, which include Eagle Trail, Buffalo Trail, South River Trail, Laurel Cliffs Nature Trail, and Senate Hole Trail. Um, and the longest of these is Eagle Trail, which is about 1.8 miles. Um, but all four of the other trails are less than a mile, but they can be hiked together to create more mileage. Um, so West Point on the Eno is a city park. Uh, that covers 404 acres located along a two-mile stretch of the Eno. And um, you may be familiar with the fact that there's a mill, a, a mill on um, this property. It is a reconstruction of the original mill that was at this location, but it's pretty cool that, you know, you can kind of really see a lot of the other mills that we talk about um, that made up uh, that were so important during the 1700s and 1800s. It's just remnants left. And of course, like I said, this is a reconstruction, but it's pretty cool to see how it would have looked and worked and operated and all of that. So of the 32 mills that once dotted the Eno, West Point was the longest running and uh, held has held a really prominent place in Eno history. Um, it functioned from 1778 to 1942. Uh, so about 164 years. Um, now, mills were extremely important uh, community centers in the early and the mid-1800s. Farmers um, who brought their grain to the grist mill interacted with each other and created a social network. There was gambling, there was gossip. Um, they were a really good location for stores and other services that farmers might need. And mill employees often lived in a community near the mill and were joined um, by craftsmen. So West Point Mill became the center of a thriving community uh, of a few hundred families. There was a general store, a blacksmith shop, a cotton gin, a sawmill, a still, all these things. Um, so West Point Mill was originally built by William Thetford and Charles Abercrombie. And in 1817, a man named Herbert Sims purchased the mill. Now, Herbert was very wealthy. He held 36 enslaved people. We will talk more about that in a few moments. Um, he forced them to work the mill and the farm. He was a justice of the peace, a major of the Eno Battalion, a militia colonel in the War of 1812, and a general assembly representative for Orange County. Now, after Herbert's first wife died in 1831, he married Rachel Cabe McCown who is the widow of Moses McCown and a daughter of John Cabe. You may be familiar with like the Cabe Lynch Trail, the Cabe family. So John Cabe was known as the Abraham of the Eno. He was a biblical figure um, and the head of a mill oligarchy. He had three wives, he had no sons, and he had nine daughters. And he ensured that they all married well. So Herbert ran the mill with Rachel until his death in 1843. And after that, Rachel operated the mill with her son, John Cabe McCown, who was her son from another marriage, her previous marriage, and Herbert's stepson. Um, and John Cabe McCown is the one who actually built um, the Greek Revival farmhouse that is still located at West Point. This is what it looks like today. Um, this is what it looked like in the 70s. Um, and he built that, John K. McCown built that house with his wife, Elizabeth Arnold, in the uh, 1850s. So after Rachel K. McCown and her son, the mill and the surrounding land passed between a few more hands until the house tract was sold to P.J. Mangum, who was really uh, instrumental in um, the founding of Durham. He was Durham's postmaster. And so he purchased uh, the house tract in 1888. And he moved his family permanently to West Point in 1889, and the Mangum family occupied the house until 1968. Um, now, a few floods severely impacted West Point Mill, including one in 1908, um, but it was the one in 1942 that caused the mill to cease operation entirely after 160 years of service. Um, it was restored. It was later restored and reopened on July 4th, 1978, around the first festival for the Eno. Um, 
And then I also just wanted to mention that the reason it's called West Point is because in 1839, a post office was built around West Point Mill. This was when the name West Point was given to the mill, the post office, the community, and it's thought to be named West Point because it was the most westerly stop on the mail route from Raleigh to Roxborough. Okay, um, so I do want to talk, I want to take a moment to like acknowledge the fact that, you know, most of the historical figures that we're talking about today or so far have talked about were, you know, white and powerful people that we hear stories about, um, that things are named after her and all of this. Um, so despite the fact that mills and farms at this time were built and operated um, on the backs of enslaved people, there tends to not be a whole lot of information on who those individuals were, you know, what their names, their names were often not recorded, um, what they were like, you know, um, and all of all of that. So in some cases, historians are able to piece together some information from records about, um, you know, enslaved people, about people of color during this time period. Um, and I definitely wanted to highlight this piece that is in Ribbons of Color, Volume 2, which you can see here. This is something that, um, you know, community members really had a lot of input on and wrote many pieces for, and they can be found on our website. Um, <clears throat> but Jessica Bandell wrote a piece in Ribbons of Color, Volume 2, titled Through the Eyes of Dink, A Reexamination of the History of West Point on the Eno, and it details um, what West Point historians have been able to learn about enslaved people at this particular mill, um, including a, one an, an individual, an enslaved individual named William Dink McCown. Um, I will refer to him as William um, as I'm talking about him, um, but I just want to talk a little bit more about him. So William was born in 1833, most likely on the estate of Herbert Sims. So his mother's name is not known, um, but it is known that she was formerly enslaved by Moses McCown, who, if you remember, was Rachel Cade McCown's first husband before she married Herbert Sims. So <laughs> all the names. William William's mother uh, likely um, arrived at West Point in April 1831 after Moses had died and his widow Rachel inherited enslaved people and married Herbert Sims. And there's not a lot of records information about what was life was like at West Point under Sims, but he was known to be, I'm quoting from Jessica Bandel's piece, um, a shrewd, self-promoting, and at times violent man. I think there was one instance where um, he actually bit off part of a man's ear when they got into a fight. Um, so with that being said, it's not far-fetched to imagine that he may have been cruel to the enslaved people under his control. Um, we know that William experienced several traumatic events in which he witnessed the uh, sale of other enslaved individuals. He uh, stayed at West Point um, until the 13th Amendment was signed into law, but um, he certainly witnessed other people that he had lived with um, being sold. So in particular, when um, Sims died, when Herbert Sims died in 1843, uh, things at West Point kind of went went crazy. Uh, the courts took on the task of, of dividing up his property, which including enslaved people among Herbert Sims's legal heirs. And it was at this time that William was separated from several of his friends, his probably family members, relatives, um, who he had lived with for years at West Point. Um, and so, you know, you can only imagine how traumatic and just deeply um, horrible and saddening that would have been. Um, in Jessica Bandel's piece, she points out that the West Point could be the site of unspeakable tragedies for the enslaved persons held there. It could also be the scene of joy and happiness. So um, there were sometimes weddings and celebrations that took place. So William married an enslaved woman named Elizabeth, or she went by Betsy, in the year 1857. Um, of course, this marriage went unrecognized by state law, um, but there were, um, the union was celebrated with, with fellow enslaved family and friends. 
Um, and after Sims died, it's likely that William actually began training as a miller under the supervision of John Cade McCown, Herbert's stepson. In 1865, the 13th Amendment became law, uh, ending the practice of slavery in the U.S., um, and William and Betsy at the time had three young children named Mary, Sarah, and Elizabeth, who went by Lizzie. They actually decided to stay at West Point, and you know the reasons for that are not clear, but are likely complex. Um, William continued to work for John Cabe McCown as a miller, and also uh, supplemented his pay by hiring out his labor as needed. Um, by 1880, they had five more children and decided to move on from West Point, but it is known that they remained in the county, but unfortunately, this is where their names are lost in the historical record. Um, and there's a lot more information, uh, you know, the piece in Ribbons of Color is, is pretty long and is really um, a good read and kind of helps to shift your perspective when thinking about the history of these places along the, you know, so I do encourage, um, you know, if you are interested to read that then absolutely um, it, is a, it is a great piece to read. Uh, last thing I'm gonna mention about West Point, uh, just see how I'm doing in time. About West Point, um, oh, this is a photo by Hugh Mangum. Oh, Hugh Mangum, um, well, I'm gonna talk about him in a moment, but he was a photographer, the uh, son of PJ Mangum. And um, this was a photo he took of the mill after the flood in 1908. And then this is just a photo of people gathered around the mill today. Um, so the Photography Museum, the current Hugh Mangum, Hugh Mangum Photography Museum used to be actually a tobacco pack house. The exact year it is built, it was built as unknown, but it was likely in the mid to late 1800s. Um, and pack houses were built to provide a safe place to store tobacco before and after the tobacco curing process. Um, which took place in some of the buildings. The curing process took place, there's one kind of building near the current photography museum that was a um, tobacco barn where it was cured. Um, but this building, particular building, was also known for other purposes. Uh, so for storing straw and hay, it was known to be used as a chicken coop at one point, and it's thought that Hugh Mangum had a small dark room on the second story that he used when he came in town. So he is now a um, well-known historical photographer. And if you go to the Hugh Mangum Museum of Photography, you can see lots of um, photos from that time period. Okay, any questions? We're gonna move on to Holden Mill in just a moment. Are we good? I don't see any questions yet. Uh, I just want to note that I, put in the chat a link to check out Durham Parks and Recreation's uh, mill tours. They're currently doing one that uh, includes the story of William Dink McCown. Uh, I also put in a, a link in the chat to check out our Ribbons of Color journal series. You can read more about Dink there as well as other stories of people of color along the Eno. Awesome, thank you, Hillary. Okay. So, Oh, I did. So these are some photos I've taken at West Point um, on the hikes there, which are always lots of fun. So uh, this is some wild ginger, a really cool plant. Um, it's when you crush it up, it smells like ginger. Um, and they have these like little jug like flowers that are produced at the base, like near the ground, um, which are really cool. They're pollinated by like ground insects, like ants and stuff like that. Um, so if you ever see these kinds of leaves in like the springish, time um lift up the leaf and see if you can see the flower because they're pretty cool um virginia spring beauties azure bluets these are all really um these tend to grow on like kind of the mossy rocky areas of west point um so those are all some cool wild flowers native wild flowers of course west point as i'm sure you know if you've been there before in the summer in particular, it is a hot spot for just people to have fun and get in the river and swim. Um, so we have mentioned our summer camps on our other summer camp that we for eight to 12 year olds called I walk the, you know, we, um, we, uh, kayak, we go, so we go to West Point on the Thursdays of those weeks and we like kayak in the river, we go cane pole fishing, we do various activities there, which is really 
um, really cool. But yeah, and then of course our festival takes place um, at West Point on the Eno each year um, on the July 4th weekend. Um, and it just transforms into a totally different place where there is amazing crafts and vendors, local vendors and music and education. And it's a wonderful, wonderful event um, that I hope if you haven't been before, you will consider um, attending this year. Um, and part of that, uh, Hillary and I spend time in the river uh, with kiddos, just catching macro invertebrates and teaching them about the river. And it's all kinds of fun. So um, yeah, just some photos of the bridge by Roxborough. And uh, this is a photo taken from the bridge of West or of the Eno. Um, awesome. Okay, Holden Mill. So um, Holden Mill, uh, to get this, to this trail, you use Fuse Forward Access in Eno River State Park, which is located at 6101 Coal Mill Road in Durham. Holden Mill is a 2.6 mile loop, um, but to get to it, you also have to start on Buck Quarter Creek, uh, which is 1.5 miles long. So in total, um, you're looking at about four miles to walk like the whole entirety of the state of all of it. Um, uh, so Isaac Holden built Holden's Mill in uh, 1813 or 1814, and then died only six years later, leaving the mill to his son Thomas in 1820. And Thomas operated the mill for just over 30 years. In 1845, we know that he actually tried unsuccessfully to sell the mill. He placed an ad in the Hillsborough Recorder um in 1844 and so we were able to learn from that that Holden Mill employed seven to eight workers it contained a sawmill a cotton gin a flax oil mill um, a corn mill a flour grinding mill threshing machine and two wool carding machines I said all those things I don't know what some of, the, some of those mean but that was what the ad said um, was included in Holden's mill the ad flaunted the mill's success by noting, among other things, that the mill produced four to 6,000 pounds of wool each year. Like I said, he was unsuccessful at selling the mill for whatever reason. Um, now, when Thomas died in 1852, the mill went to his son-in-law, John Lyon, who ran it for 16 years until 1968 when it was closed due to financial difficulties. And in 1882, Samuel Cole, who is the sixth son of Anthony Cole, all these kinds of connections, uh, reopened the mill and oversaw its operation until 1893, when the mill closed for a second and final time. And remnants of the mill can still be seen on the Holden Mill Trail within the state park. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about Thomas's son, William um, Billy Holden. Um, or William Woods Holden. Uh, he was born in, but I'll just refer to him as William. Um, so William was born in 1818 to Priscilla Woods and Thomas Holden, who, as you'll remember, was the son of Isaac Holden, who held the mill for a while. So he was born to Priscilla Woods and Thomas Holden, who were unmarried. Thomas instead married a woman named Sally Nichols in 1819, so the year after William was born. Um, and together, Thomas and Sally had 10 children, not counting William. William's mother, Priscilla, actually acted as a single parent to William until he was about six, at which point Sally, the stepmother, went to Priscilla Woods' home without any prior discussion with Thomas and convinced Sally that William would be better off living with Thomas, his father, and Sally. Um, so when William was an adult, he said that moving to live with his father's family was the happiest day of his young life, which... Yeah, it's kind of sad for his um, mother. Uh, but he was close with his father and stepmother, but not to his half siblings. Um, he started an apprenticeship at age 10 at the Hillsborough Recorder and then struck out on his own at age 16. He actually studied law for a bit, but was really fascinated by newspaper work. And he purchased control of the North Carolina Standard, a newspaper in 1842, where he served as the publisher and editor. Um, until he was elected governor in 1968. So William grew up in the slaveholding South. Um, he held enslaved people himself uh, and was an advocate for slavery for, for a while, although he didn't believe in the secession of the Southern states. 
in the Civil War. However, after the Civil War ended and the 13th Amendment became law, Holden started arguing that white people needed to help Black formerly enslaved people. And he said this publicly in some speeches, which, as you can imagine, was like problematic at, to other people at the time. Um, when he was elected 40th governor of North Carolina, he used his power to appoint men of color into leadership positions and was really trying to suppress the very prominent Ku Klux Klan, as I kind of mentioned earlier, talking about the confluence. So as a result of this, um, he became the first governor in the U.S. to be impeached and removed from office. Um, so and if you remember, when I was talking about the confluence, William Shepard's great grandson was the one who drew up the articles of impeachment for William Holden. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention um, was that I said that, you know, when you're on um, Holden's, to get to Holden Mill, Holden's Mill Trail, you have to start on Buck Quarter Creek. So if you go up through the woods, you can um, see the Cole family homestead. So this on the left is a photo of the Cole family homestead. It's a two-story building, which uh, indicated a lot of wealth at the time. It was built in the mid to late 1800s by the Cole family. And then over here, this is a photo um, that if you take a right, just when you're getting to um, the, the Anthony Cole house you, and walk down a little ways, uh, you see what's called the sister's house. And it's thought that um, Anthony Cole, Anthony Cole's sister wanted to live with him and he did not want that. And so he built her her own house a little bit like close to their property. Um, and that is all for uh, Holden's Mill. So, you know, I just want to conclude by saying um, that the Eno has been so incredibly important for so many people in so many communities throughout time. Um, for indigenous people, for enslaved people, for people of color, for mill owners, for all of these various people. And I'm really glad that we got to spend some time together today talking through some of the interesting and the important history and ecology of some of my favorite Eno trails. These are all truly some of my favorite trails. And um, I hope that you all get out there on them and maybe have learned a little bit about their history and, and can keep an eye out for some cool wildflowers in the spring. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for our registration to open for our April and our May hike series. They fill up very fast, but, um, but it makes sense because they're a whole lot of fun um, and you learn a lot. We have some great um, hike volunteer leaders. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. Are there any questions or thoughts? We're doing it. Uh, we had a couple of questions um, from Dane, uh, and I answered them in the chat, but I can mention them. So Dane asked if the 1908 flood that damaged the West Point Mill was the same flood that destroyed the Holden Mill. And the answer is yes. And it also um, destroyed the coal mill and was a big part really of the downfall of the mill industry yeah. along the Eno. Yeah. So 1908 was a big it year. It was that one, 1908. And it also destroyed, I think, Senate's, I think it washed away Michael Sennett's mill. There are several mills that you might hear that that, that particular flood of 1908 definitely caused a lot of damage to the milling world. Mm -hmm. um, Dane also asked about the older dam that's upstream of the Holden mill, um, the, the remnants that you can see of Holden mill. And as far as I know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Audrey, if you know, uh, that was the first iteration of Holden mill and they built a stronger one mm. a little bit downstream. Okay. I'm date. actually not sure, but that's really interesting. That's my understanding is that the, cool. that first Holden mill was not strong enough and they built a second one. Um, um very cool. We have a couple of couple of other thoughts and questions. So uh, Dane asks, do we ever need volunteers to help build or maintain trails like the new ones at the confluence? I think that was a question you already know the answer to, Dane. And thank you for <laughs> asking. That's a fantastic question. Uh, Audrey, do you want to answer that? <laughs> sure. Yeah, we absolutely uh, have stewardship work days where we um, get people out to help build. So we actually ha have a, a new preserve opening in the coming uh, later this this year 
called Panther Branch, and uh, we've we've done all the trail building for that. But that was a really good example of um, of when we had members of the community help us to really build those trails and and get to know the land and all of that. Um, I don't know specifically about the ones, the new ones at the confluence. Um, but, and also I will say that you said maintain trails. We have a trail stewards program. So if that's something that um, anyone might be interested, we would put you in connection with our, uh, with our land and stewardship director, Kim Livingston. Um, but uh, absolutely, we love to have help from community members um, when it comes to, of course, the trails are made for community members. So it's great to have um, them involved in that process. And that's something that you can sign up for on our website. So thank you for asking. Did I yeah, speaking of volunteering, uh, for our spring wildflower hike series, we are in need of sweeps. So the wildflower hike series takes place on Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. Um, I have most of my leaders in place, but if you're interested in sweeping a hike and learning more about the Eno and more about the wildflowers specifically, please feel free to send me an email. It's just hillary at enoriver.org, if that might be of interest of you or uh, to you. Um, we had one last question from Christine. Christine wonders uh, if we'll send a link to the recording to your emails. And um, yes, once I figure out how exactly to do that, I will make sure <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Got to figure out the technology, which I'll probably do on Monday, and we'll figure that out and make sure that you get the link. Um, and then we'll also put it on our YouTube channel as well. Speaking of which, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>